Welcome to Know Your Bible. Today we're going to look at the creation of man. Now although we're not given details about how the fish, birds or animals were created, we are given both the reason for the creation of man and the way in which he was formed. We are also told how and why the woman was made. In this study we will consider these details. Well, what was the purpose for the creation of man? We're told that God said, let us make man. The Hebrew word used here for God is Elohim and means mighty or powerful ones. It is a plural word from the Hebrew ale, meaning power. This word ale is often translated God throughout the Bible. Compare Psalm 90 and verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The word Elohim can be used to speak of angels, for they do the will of and work of God. It is used this way in Psalm 8 and verse 5, which is a commentary on Genesis 1 and verse 26. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. And again, bless the Lord you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. In Genesis 1 and verse 26 we are told, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Man was created in the physical shape or image of the angels. In fact, angels have at times been mistaken for men. In fact, among other places, Genesis 18 and verse 1 shows how that the Lord appeared to Abraham. Man was also created with the mental capacity to be in the likeness of God, that is, to absorb his thoughts and reflect his moral values. Unlike the animals, man can reason on a moral plane and can comprehend spiritual ideas. This distinctive feature is the basis upon which God deals with mankind. God's purpose in creating man in his image and likeness was so that the man could come to understand the glorious character of his creator and to try to develop that creator himself. God's desire was that they might willingly reflect his image in all its glory. Adam failed to do this by sinning against God. However, Jesus Christ, who always did his Father's will, was the complete manifestation of his Father's character. We read in uh, first Col uh, Colossians 1 and verse 15 that he is the image of the invisible God. And John 14 tells us, He who has seen me has seen the Father, because he always spoke and acted like his Father. As Jesus manifested God's character, so those who desire to serve God are to be conformed to the image of his Son. Here's the example we must follow that we might be like God. We are told in Genesis 1 verse 26, let them have dominion. God intended man to have dominion over the works of his creation. This could only be sustained as long as he remained in harmony with God. But man sinned and lost his dominion. This does not mean that God's purpose failed, but rather that man must now look for the way back to harmony with his Creator. God has graciously provided this way through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who by his perfect obedience gained the victory over sin and death. Through him, God has opened the way for all those who faithfully obey his teaching to share this dominion in the future. We are told that when God had finished his work of creation, that he pronounced it very good. And that at the beginning of chapter 2, we find that God rested from all his works. This was the seventh day where we get the word Sabbath from, but we'll come back to that subject in a moment. In verse 7 of chapter 2, God returns to the detail of the sixth day by showing the detail of the birth of man. 
We are told in Genesis 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The word formed is the same Hebrew word translated potter in Isaiah chapter 64. The angels formed the shape of man, which was after their image, as a potter shapes the clay. The same word is used for the creation of animals and birds in Genesis 2 and verse 19. And the Lord God formed him and he breathed into his nostrils. It is the same word in Haggai 1 and verse 9 as blue. We are further told that man became a living being or as the King James Version has it, a living soul. The Hebrew here is Neshama Kaim literally breath of lives. This is the same breath as that breathed by the animals. Genesis 7 and verses 22 to 23 tells us. We are told that he became a living being or a living soul. We have looked at these same two words in our previous video and learned that they are rendered living creature or the Hebrew is nefesh chaim when referring to animals, birds and fish. These words in no way support the claim that man has an immortal soul. Man is a natural animal body. Immortality is a promise for those who faithfully serve God. In Genesis 2 and verse 18 we read that the Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. As he named the various creatures, he was aware that each animal had its mate but he was created alone. The affinity between male and female animals is purely sensual. Man needed more than that if he was to reflect the whole character of God. He needed a companion who would help him, one ideally suited to assist him in the purpose for which he was created. So by a distinctive act of creation, God made the woman out of the man. God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam and from one of his ribs, God built his counterpart, woman. Adam immediately realized that she bore a likeness to him and was not to be found amongst the animals. So he called her woman, a word meaning out of man. God now pronounced the principles for marriage. For we read, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Companionship between the man and his wife was to produce a unity in harmony with God. These principles have never been changed by God and are as valid today as they were then. The purpose for this unity in marriage is that together a man and woman may develop godly characters through a love for their Creator and one another and a desire to develop a likeness to him. Now we can return to the question of the seventh day, the day that God rested. We read in Genesis 2 and verses 1 to 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. The word ended here in verse 2 is the same as finished in verse 1. It means to end something because it is completed or finished. The work of reorganizing of the earth from its state of chaos into a beautiful place where life could be sustained was finished. Vegetation was abundant and fish, birds, animals and finally man inhabited these delightful surroundings. We therefore come to the seventh day and look to the lessons that this day set forth. And he rested on the seventh day, we're told. The Hebrew word for rested is Shabbat, from which is derived the word Sabbath. Its meaning is to cease or desist. We are told in Genesis 2 and verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. 
You see, God gave this day a particular significance, and by sanctifying it, he set it apart, as the word means. The reason for this was that he would include it in his law to Israel hundreds of years later. He would use it as a parable of his great purpose to fill the earth with his glory, when all creation would be in harmony with him. And we should know the following points regarding the Sabbath. There is no record of the Sabbath being kept as a special day until Israel was brought out from Egypt. It is first mentioned in Exodus chapter 16. The Sabbath law was one of the Ten Commandments. It, all, it only applied to Israel and not to the nations around Israel. The spirit of the Sabbath was that a person would cease from his own works and do the works of God. Keeping the Sabbath, together with the rituals and other special days which were part of the law given to Moses, was no longer a requirement for believers after the death of Jesus. Christians are told to regard no day as more important than another. The Sabbath, like other so-called holy days, is not binding on believers in Christ today. Jesus Christ says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And finally, the Sabbath points forward to the rest that God has in store for all his faithful children. That rest that God provides is certainly one I'm sure that all are looking forward to in this day and generation.